The objectives of this module are to present the history of building codes in the U.S. and current status, explain the difference between codes, zoning requirements, and laws, provide an overview of the International Building Code, and present a methodology for conducting a code analysis and tabulating design criteria. A building code is a set of rules that specify the minimum standards for constructed objects such as buildings. The main purpose of building codes are to protect health, safety, and general welfare related to both the construction and the occupancy of buildings and structures. Building code becomes law of a particular jurisdiction when formally enacted by appropriate authority. Design codes are combined with an assessment of stakeholder needs to generate design guidelines and criteria. Now, a note on codes versus standards. Design codes reference certain standards, which are then said to be part of the design code. So, to comply with a given code, you must comply with the associated standards. Said another way, a standard, then, is a document that defines the characteristics of a product, process, or service, such as dimensions, safety aspects, and performance requirements. Standards provide technical guidelines for promoting and evaluating safety, reliability, productivity, and efficiency. Before we move on, let's make sure you understand this terminology. You may be wondering, who writes the standards? Well, standards are prepared by experts with knowledge and expertise in a particular area. Those experts generally come from professional societies, such as the American Society for Testing and Materials, the American Society for Mechanical Engineers, American Society of Civil Engineers, etc. Don't forget, this may be you someday, and serving on these standards committees is an important part of what professional engineers do. So that's where the standards come from. But let's talk a little bit more about building codes. First of all, why do we have building codes? The answer is life, safety, and the protection of human health. Who is responsible for code compliance? That's you, specifically though, the engineer and architects of record. And who determines which codes apply? That is the state, county, or local jurisdiction. It's important to note and understand that codes are not legally enforceable until they're adopted by a jurisdiction. For you history buffs, it's interesting to note that the need for codes to protect the public health was recognized a long time ago. The Code of Hammurabi was developed in 1772 BC, and, well, it has some interesting provisions. If a builder build a house for someone and does not construct it properly, and the house which he built fall in and kill its owner, then that builder shall be put to death. We've come a long way since the Code of Hammurabi, but code development is a uniquely historic process. This is an image of the 1871 Chicago Fire, often called the Great Chicago Fire. It destroyed thousands of buildings and killed an estimated 300 people. And this is an image of the 1906 San Francisco earthquake. In addition to structural damage, it caused devastating fires, which killed about 3,000 people and destroyed almost 80% of the city of San Francisco. After several days of chaos, it went down in history as one of the worst, deadliest natural disasters in U.S. history. In more recent history, the collapse of the Twin Towers on 9-11 and the devastation caused by Hurricane Katrina stand out as horrible disasters where loss of human life was at least partially tied to the way that we engineers designed and built buildings and infrastructure. So why do I bring up these horrible tragedies? To make this important point, building codes are often developed retroactively and are a reaction to disasters like these. Codes are so important because they capture the best practices learned by previous generations to avoid loss of human life. For this reason, and many more, you should take codes seriously and make your best effort to comply with any codes that apply to your project. What do I mean? Well, the 1871 Chicago fire led to the first fire provisions in code. The 1906 San Francisco earthquake led to the first seismic provisions. The 2001 9-11 attacks led to increased egress requirements for high-rise buildings, and Hurricane Katrina in 2005 led to an overhaul of flood provisions in the code. You now know a little bit about the history and logic behind code development. It's time to dig into modern code and how it works, but before we explore that, let's make sure we're clear on our terminology. Codes are directly related to public health and safety. An example of a code requirement is the roof must be designed to support 50 PSF of snow load. Zoning requirements are less related to public health and safety. An example of a zoning requirement is you can build a residence here, but not an office. Federal laws impose targeted requirements on building projects. For example, the Americans with Disabilities Act ensures that built structures serve all people. And there may be other legislation which our project might fall under. 
An example of this is Colorado has a water use law that governs water storage, surface water, wells, and many other things. Returning to codes, prior to 2000, there was a whole cadre of different building codes that might be referenced depending on the state you were working in. The slightly humorous part of this mix of code documents was that they were all named in such a way that you could be forgiven for thinking they were applied everywhere. The Uniform Building Code, National Building Code, and Standard Building Code were actually not uniform, national, or standard for the U.S. However, in 2000, the International Building Code was released. It combined the previous codes into one. Keeping with previous tradition, the International Building Code is not actually international. It only applies within the United States. It's currently in use or adopted in all 50 states, the District of Columbia, and several U.S. territories. A new edition of the IBC is released every three years, but remember, it's up to state, county, and local jurisdictions to decide which codes apply. We'll come back to this point later. While we're focused on building codes in this module, it's important to note that there's an entire family of code documents produced by the International Code Council. So you may see other documents referenced, depending on the type of project you're undertaking. In any case, remember none of these are legally enforceable unless adopted by the local jurisdiction. All ICC code documents are freely available online via their website. You can use the link shown to view them. If we zoom in on the International Building Code, you will see that it's subdivided into logical sections that make it easy to find the area of interest. But we should highlight a key point about the International Building Code, and that is the referenced standards. Each reference standard is considered a part of the code. To comply with the code, you must comply with these standards and pay special attention to the year listed for which standard you're complying with. Dozens of referenced organizations, including ASTM, UL, NFPA, ASCE, and many, many more, are referenced by the code. Now let's pause for a minute and check your understanding. Great. Now let's talk about how to approach code analysis for your project. Step one is to determine which IBC code is adopted by the state you're working in. The link shown will take you to an interactive map that allows you to determine this with a few clicks. For Jefferson County in Colorado, at least at the time of the creation of this video, the ICC site shows the following information. That's a good start, but we need to continue digging. It's important to determine if the county has made any amendments to the state code or adopted another code altogether. They have the authority, so let's go to the county website, in this case, Jefferson County, and double check the adopted building codes. It turns out that Jefferson County actually does have supplemental requirements for buildings and residential construction. One example out of these supplements is an addendum requiring a more stringent minimum snow load capacity. This makes sense, right? We probably get more snow than the average U.S. location, and so the county wants to make sure structures can handle that increased local condition. And that brings up a key point. In general, local modifications to the code tend to be more stringent than the IBC. You can probably guess the next step in our code analysis procedure. We need to research the codes at the city level. These are usually easily accessible on the city website, but if you have a hard time finding them, don't be afraid to call the building department in the local city. Also, watch out for other jurisdictional codes you might run into at the city level, such as historic districts, which often have their own set of requirements that will be imposed on the project. Once you've completed the previous steps, talk to your client, faculty advisor, or consultants about any additional research needed to identify other legal requirements or zoning requirements. An example of these types of other requirements is, a previous senior design team was tasked to design a micro-hydro power generation system. They had to comply with the Clear Creek County guidelines and regulations for matters of state interest, also known as the 1041 regulations. Now, after you've completed this process, you may find that state requirements conflict with some local requirements. If that happens, you should constrain yourself with the most stringent of the two requirements. Now that the required codes are clearly identified for your project, you'll need to review the reference standards that the code points to. Remember, the ICC family of codes is free and available online. Also, Arthur Lake Library has a hard copy of the 2009 IBC on hand, and several good guidebooks to help you in your code analysis. Some of the reference standards may be more difficult to obtain, though. Don't be afraid to reach out for help to faculty or library staff. Your final step will be to formalize your code analysis. Combine this information you've gathered with your stakeholder needs analysis and write your design criteria. Submit it with your key deliverables. Use it as a communication tool on your team. Take a look at the example of professional work attached to this module for a helpful template.
The design criteria is generally the first calculation in the engineer's calc book, and most jurisdictions require the engineer's calc book to be signed, sealed, and submitted. In closing, we do not expect you to be experts on this. We know that the codes are long and tedious. We do expect you to conduct some research so you can learn about how code requirements constrain designs, and we want you to practice tabulating and presenting design criteria. Talk to your faculty advisor for more specific information and for help selecting references specific to your project. That's it for code analysis. Please complete the quiz below to check your understanding.